Right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is uh, Anam Shiraz, and I am a data engineer at Jagex. Uh, so today's talk will be about what it takes to uh, manage tags at scale. I'll be especially focusing on the deployments, the release process, versionings, and the package managements. So Airflow is becoming a go-forward tool for not only us, but data analysts, data scientists, and across other teams. And everyone was trying to adopt their own methodology on how they can um, manage the tags. So most of them were facing issues, especially at the start, but also at the point where they had 100 or even 50 or 20 DAGs. Um, issues like library management, scaling, uh, syncing, and upgrading to new Airflow version, deployments, rollbacks, and et cetera. So we, as a data engineer, took the responsibility to make this entire process uh, easy enough for the teams who are using, uh, especially how to spin up a new Airflow version so that it is easily uh, manageable by us and uh, maintainable and usable by the teams who are using, including us. So to, in today's talk, I will be going through exactly how we did this, uh, especially the issues we faced, the resolutions we made, and hope that the work that we have done could potentially benefit your work at your organization in some way, and would also like to get some feedbacks from you guys. So a bit about Jagex, uh, some of you may have already heard of, is a, a gaming company with its uh, most famous flagship uh, multiplayer online uh, title RuneScape and old school RuneScape. We are also a publisher. Uh, we publish third party games from like-minded studios. Um, we currently have around uh, 300 million unique users created since launch 2001. Uh, we have over 1 million uh, members and over 500,000 daily active users. Uh, we have around 110 ETL pipelines running, uh, capturing, transforming, and storing the data. On top of which, we have analytics and uh, data science pipelines running, uh, capturing useful insights from the data and uh, bringing business values. So the issues and the resolutions we made, I have actually broken them down into today's agenda, <coughs> which I'll be going through. Um, so first of all, I'll be showing how we defined a process through which we could uh, keep track of the airflow state as well as the DAG states. Um, I will show how we um, came up with uh, easy and not an over-engineered way to revert back to the previous states. Um, then how we are managing our DAGs code base. Then on the deployment side, how we release our next Airflow version and um, so what are the steps involved in our CICD pipeline for the Airflow deployments. And then in the end, I would try to answer most common question about DAG package dependencies. So, okay, so all we wanted to achieve was something uh, simple like this. Uh, so we wanted to have one Airflow version that represents uh, sets of tags uh, with specific versions so that we are aware of uh, what sets of tags are running on this specific Airflow version and what exact changes are being done by who. Um, our initial thoughts were to have a single Airflow repository uh, with all of our custom DAGs uh, in that repository with a Docker file that inherits from official Airflow base, for, base image, and then installing the custom DAGs um, into the base Airflow image tags directory, and optionally installing any additional packages if required, then finally generating the uh, Airflow image. Um, the obvious problems here were, of course, every one was making commits on the single repository, every owner of the DAGs, and they were trying to make their own <clears throat> DAG versions uh, tags on the same repository, which was, of course, becoming hard to manage at a point. You know, let's say if we have 20, more than 20 DAGs, it becomes hard to manage at that point. 
So since repositories are cheap, so we split the DAGs into their own repositories. <clears throat> but the problem here was how a flow repository is going to identify what DAG version needs to be captured while releasing the next Airflow version for um, production. So the approach here we uh, followed was uh, using Git submodules, where every DAG is being served as a submodule uh, to the Airflow repository. With this, uh, you can maintain a specific state of the DAG by referencing to its uh, master branch, working branch, a specific tag, or even a specific commit. Um, you can initialize the sub module by uh, following command, get sub module add, and the link of that uh, DAG repository. Um, and this step needs to be done once. After that, you just have to change the version of these uh, tags, which I'll be showing you in the next slide. <clears throat> so given a timeline where we have these three repositories, um, let's say the developer of DAG1 and DAG2 wants to uh, release version 3 and 2, respectively, into the Airflow production. So all they will do is, um, in the Airflow repository, since both of these DAGs are already defined as submodules, they will kind of go into the custom DAG directory where all of our DAGs are there. From there, they will say git submodule update in it. So this is actually going to um, fetch the latest master branch of both of these submodules, tag one and tag two. And then finally releasing the next Airflow version and pushing it to ECR. Later at some point, business realizes that there has been some issues with the latest version of tag one. Um, all the developer will, the developer of tag one will do is um, revert back to the previous state of tag one. So in this case, all he has to do is in Airflow repository um, from that specific uh, tag submodule directory, you will say git checkout v2, simple as that. And then we generate a new version of Airflow and pushing it to VCR. So um, in this case, uh, since everything is version controlled, so we exactly know uh, what DAGs are present in which Airflow uh, version and what changes has to be done by who. So it, it became really easy to track uh, and publish. And also as a good practice, we were uh, keeping these versions in the tags while defining the tag so that we can view it on the web server UI, like which, for, which version of the tag and the operators are being used. <clears throat> So moving on to the steps involved in our CACD pipeline for release process, uh, which actually triggers on the master branch of Airflow repository. So the first step is, of course, you initialize all of the submodules, uh, get some module update in it, as I mentioned earlier. Next is we run a DAG validation test. So note here that the DAGs unit test is being done on the DAGs individual repositories. Whereas in here, we are just uh, doing the validation test whether all of these tags, which are initialized as some modules, are properly loadable in Airflow, uh, especially any syntax errors or any circlet dependencies in the task, et cetera. And then finally, we generate the version based on symmetric versions. Um, so it's a patch when we have any change in an existing DAG. It's a feature whenever we have a new DAG. And of course, it's a major if you have a breaking change, like for example, if you change the official base image uh, version of Airflow from one to two, et cetera. Then we finally build the Airflow image inheriting from official Airflow base image and then installing the custom tags, which we loaded in the first step as some modules. <clears throat> and yeah, of course, we push it to ECR. Um, then we update the ham charts and Argo CD sync. I am going to zoom into both of these last steps in our, my last in next slide. So as I said, in the master branch, we release the Airflow version, we push it to ECR. And uh, along the this, this same side on the next step, we actually update the ham values 
what exactly I mean by this is that we have the hand chart of our Airflow within this Airflow repository where we are actually updating the Airflow image version um, in, in that chart. And once that's done, we uh, push this small commit again to the master branch. From there onwards, Argo CD is actually synced with the master branch of this Airflow repository, which actually updates the uh, corresponding EKS cluster. So this, this small commit here uh, is done in the pipeline uh, to make sure that um, Argo CD is always fetching the latest version of the Airflow, which we generated through the pipelines. Um, right, so yeah, we have covered um, almost all of these uh, points. Uh, I think before moving on to the next one, uh, it's also worth mentioning that uh, for those of you who are not already aware, there is already a DAG uh, improvement, Airflow improvement proposal for DAG versionings, Airflow 36, uh, oh, A AIP 36. Um, do, do check it out. Uh, it's a really good feature. <laughs> so basically, you will be able to view and uh, select different DAG versions from the Airflow web UI. Uh, do, do go and have a look and upvote it. I would really like to see this in upcoming Airflow release. So yeah. <clears throat> OK, so moving on. Um, how we um, manage the DAG package dependencies, especially uh, avoiding the scenarios where we have package dependency conflicts. Um, so given a scenario where you have a scheduler that is running two DAGs, and both of these DAGs have uh, two tasks, each using HTTP operator, Python operator, MySQL operator, or whichever operator it needs to run. <clears throat> so, uh, both, both of these tags could have like different uh, packages uh, requirements. Uh, as you can see, they both are using pandas and numpy, but uh, they are using different versions of each of these packages. So what possible problems one could face in this scenario? Um, so first thing you need to keep in mind is that um, Airflow uh, workers also use the same Airflow image, which is being used by the scheduler. Um, but I think in Kubernetes Executor, you have an option to define a different image for workers, but that image also has to have Airflow installed in it. And not only that, but you have to keep the same Airflow version as well as the same configurations as it is in the scheduler. Um, so that means you can um, create multiple images of the same Airflow, uh, multiple copies of the same Airflow image for each of your DAG. Uh, but we have better options, uh, which we will look at in, in a while. Um, so given that if you want to keep all of these packages in the same Airflow image, uh, in that case, it will be like hard to track which package is being used by which tag. And especially it becomes hard to uh, clean up these packages while tag removal or upgrade. Um, also, if it's not even possible to keep multiple versions of the same package within the same virtual environment. So um, what could also uh, come up with uh, an idea of creating virtual environments for each tag in the same Airflow repository or in the same Airflow image, but um, ramping up and down these virtual environments for each tag while tag starts and stop is a process on its own, which of course, if one would try to automate this process, would slow down the entire workflow and needs extra effort to maintain these virtual environments. So before moving on to the solution, all right, okay. Yeah, I think this uh, Google Slides is actually presenting all of, all of my points here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, no I, did, I did animation here so <laughs> to pop up these points, but anyway, you can see all of them. <laughs> anyway, uh, so yeah, before moving on to the solution, one should have a clear understanding about uh, workflow execution and workflow management. 
so workflow execution is a space where your business logic is being conformed. And that actually happens inside your DAG tasks. Whereas workflow management is a space where um, Airflow is actually managing your tasks, managing DAGs, uh, when your DAG needs to run, managing package dependencies, sorry, task dependencies, I mean. Um, managing XCOMs between the tasks, uh, service level agreements, alerts, monitorings, and all sort of that managing Airflow stuff is being performed on the management side. Um, so it's uh, so basically these both spaces does not necessarily have to share the same environment, um, the same uh, virtual environment. So yes, as I said, uh, each tag would have their own um, virtual environments, but the question is where to keep these virtual environments. So um, we we need a, a way to kind of provide an isolation between these two layers. Um, and the idea how we could do this is uh, build Docker container uh, to perform that business logic and install all of the, your packages which are required by that specific business logic inside this container and let Airflow run this container. And how we could do this is by using either of these operators, Docker operator or Kubernetes pod operator. So with these operators, you can actually uh, run your custom defined uh, Docker image uh, in Airflow. Um, so basically uh, all of your business logic, which is running inside this Docker, uh, which is the workflow execution, is not at all aware about what is happening outside the container. Um, so what that means is that uh, you can define, uh, you can run your code uh, in any of your favorite programming language, not only Python, uh, wrap it in a container and test it in your local machine without needing to spin up an Airflow instance. Um, and once you are happy with your code, you just give a reference to the same Docker image to any of these containers, and they are going to run in Airflow for you. So it really becomes easy to debug and easy to uh, uh, debug in a case where like you have come across an issue and you will easily be able to identify whether that issue is in workflow execution or workflow management. So let's have a closer look at um, both of these operators. Docker operator, it lets you run the Docker containers within the same Airflow worker node. Um, so given a scheduler, uh, when it, oh, now it's appearing. <laughs> it's quite weird, but anyway. So you have Docker, uh, you have a scheduler, which is uh, spinning up a DAG, which requires two tasks, both of them using Docker container, uh, sorry, Docker operator. And uh, what, it, what this task will actually do is spin up a container within the same uh, worker node. Uh, you can <laughs> give reference to an image and optionally provide any arguments. Uh, and also you can provide uh, um, arguments to uh, basically uh, provide uh, custom resources like CPU and memory allocations to this uh, container. But given the fact that because this container is running within the same worker node, so you are limited uh, the memory and CPU allocation for that worker node, so you cannot expand that uh, limit. Um, but the the workflow management and workflow execution in this case is the, uh, as you can see in the green color, is workflow execution, and the, <clears throat> everything happening outside this container is workflow management, which is being done by the Airflow. So yeah, that's Docker operator. So let's have a look at. Um, the given spot operator, which actually lets you run the Docker container on a dedicated worker node in a Kubernetes cluster. <clears throat> so what I mean by that is uh, you have a scheduler which uh, spins up these uh, two tasks and both of these tasks are using Kubernetes spot operator. So what happens after that is um, both of these Kubernetes pod operators uh, spins up a new worker node uh, in which 
your actual uh, the Docker container is running where you have to find your business logic. Um, and everything here is running on a dedicated machine, uh, also known as pod in Kubernetes world. And the reason why pod B and C are called watcher pods is because uh, these are responsible for spinning up the worker pods. And not only that, it, they are also keeping track of the states of these worker pods and uh, feeding it back to the scheduler to update the metadata, uh, whether they are running uh, failed or succeeded or whatever this they, they are in state for. And as soon as the worker pods finish, they also fetch the logs of these worker pods and you can view them on the, your web server. Um, so the workflow execution and workflow management in this case would look something like this. <clears throat> right. So looking at the pros and cons of both of these operators. Uh, so first let's um, highlight the advantages that both of these share. So first off, yeah, you no longer need to overpopulate the Airflow image with any extra uh, packages required because, okay, <laughs> okay. because uh, uh, yes, uh, every task that you're defining is now wrapped up inside a Docker uh, container. Um, so yeah, and um, the next step is Yes, as I mentioned, you can um, define custom resources while spinning up your uh, task, uh, like how many, how much CPU it needs, how much memory it needs. Then uh, my personal favorite, you are no longer bound to Python anymore. So we have uh, uh, tasks which are running Java as well as uh, one of them is running Go as well, um, which are being run as part of uh, these operators. So it is cool. Um, yes, you can reuse the same image with different args as I showed before. So one of the tasks was using uh, args as fetch data and the other task was using the same image with different args as load data. So basically this gives you more flexibility of uh, managing your workflow more efficiently. So in a case where your business logic has four steps involved, and um, if you break four, four steps into four tasks in a DAG, then um, if first three succeeds and the last one fail, you don't have to run the entire four steps of that business logic again. You just click that last task and clear, it will restart again. So yeah, that's, that's uh, one of the cool feature uh, this could have. Uh, is more flexible. Um, then, yeah, it is easy to debug um, because of the obvious reasons, as I mentioned before. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, I think uh, the drawbacks, ooh, now they're appearing. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, okay. So uh, the Drawbacks here, as I mentioned, for Docker operator, because you are running a container within an existing worker node. So of course you are uh, limited to the worker node uh, CPU and MMD allocation. So you, you cannot exceed that. This is actually not the case in Kubernetes pod operator because of the fact that this operator runs that, uh, runs your Docker container in a dedicated machine. <clears throat> so yeah, you can like uh, define uh, as much CPU, as much memory as you require, uh, which your Kubernetes cluster can manage, of course. Um, for speaking about the drawbacks of Kubernetes pod operator, which in my opinion are quite minor, is of course you need to have Kubernetes knowledge. Uh, by that, I mean, you have to have a Kubernetes cluster up and running before you could use uh, Kubernetes executor and Kubernetes support operators. Um, and as I mentioned uh, before that uh, Kubernetes support operator uh, runs uh, 
pair of uh, nodes. One is watch report, one is uh, work report. So for every task, you are you are always going to have two workers, uh, two machines running. So which is gonna slightly slow down the uh, process, but mm, it's a bit minor. Um, I think that is all. <laughs> I'm quite quite early, <laughs> but yeah, I think uh, for the last slides, uh, yeah, thank you. Any questions or suggestions? Oh, sorry. I think uh, one thing, one point I forgot to mention here is that uh, this this does not mean that we are not using any other operators at all. Uh, we do uh, for like simple processes uh, where we do not require any additional packages like Python operator, HTTP operator, to name a few. And it is also worth keeping extra Python packages within the same Airflow image if those packages are used by more than 80% of your DAX. So one of the example in our case was in Airflow 1. Uh, we wanted to use StatsD, but uh, Airflow version 1 was not providing all of the uh, stat mat matrices, which were there in Airflow version 2. So we had to add uh, our custom matrices. So for that, we had to install StatsD uh, package in all of our DAGs. So that's why we installed that StatsD uh, Python package in Airflow, Airflow image. So, yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, that, that's all. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, any questions, suggestions, or thoughts? Uh, you can watch more of my content in my fairly new YouTube channel. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you so much.